I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is for my professional responsibility class. Today, I'm going to be talking about Model Rule 1.6, which is about confidential information that the lawyer is supposed to protect that belongs to their client. This could be any information related to the representation. This is a heavily tested subject on the MPRE on most law school exams in this type of course, and it could be on your next gen bar exam or on the UBE as one of your essay topics. So having said that, let's dive in. So 1.6a says that a lawyer shall not reveal information relating to the representation of a client unless, and it has three caveats. First, the client gives informed consent. The disclosure is impliedly authorized in order to carry out the representation. Or three, disclosure is permitted by B. B is going to be our section about uh, exceptions, basically. So let's just unpack this for a moment here. If the client expressly authorizes you to make a disclosure, like you ask them, is it okay if I tell the other party this information? Or if I hold a press conference and announce this, if they have given you consent and you've explained to them what the trade-offs are involved in making that disclosure, th there's no problem. It's not a violation, even if it's highly sensitive information. And then we're going to talk about things that are impliedly authorized. So if the client tells you, I want you to file a lawsuit on my behalf, well, as part of that, you're going to have to uh, disclose some basic facts about their case or their claim or their defense and the fact that you are the attorney of record representing them and so forth. So some of those disclosures are already implied by the fact that the client wants you to file pleadings or file a motion to dismiss or to negotiate a plea bargain or something like that. So in all of those issues, then you will have a sort of implied authorization to make disclosures. Let's go back to our rule. Now, this confidentiality rule applies to disclosures by a lawyer that do not in uh, themselves reveal protected information, but could reasonably lead to the discovery of such information by a third person. Um, and this could be implied. So you're talking to someone and you say things that basically give away uh, who your client is and some private information about your client, or it could be inadvertent, right? So you go out drinking with old law school buddies and each of you is bragging about your most interesting cases and clients. And in the course of it, you end up talking about uh, your client and revealing some confidential things uh, about the case. A lot of the disclosures that happen by lawyers in practice are actually careless like this and or negligent where they're just talking to people or socializing with other lawyers and they want to um, talk about their interesting cases that they're working on and they end up sharing confidential information in the process. It could also be careless in the sense that you have a telephone conversation with your client in a crowded elevator and everybody around you can hear what you're talking about. They can definitely hear your side of it and they might even be able to hear some of what the client is saying on the other end of the phone. Um, you can use hypotheticals to discuss issues about the representation uh, if you want, if you need to talk to someone else about it, as long as the listener cannot figure out the identity of the uh, client or the situation involved. So uh, sometimes there's social media sites where lawyers can kind of um, ask other lawyers for advice or input about how to handle a case. Well, don't give your client's name or very specific facts or location or the um, identity of the parties but you could um, give a hypothetical that is general enough that other people won't know who you're talking about. Now, let's talk about impliedly authorized. Uh, you're, a lawyer can be impliedly authorized to make disclosures about a client, as I mentioned earlier, um, if it's appropriate in carrying out the representation. And in the comments to this rule, the ABA gives the example uh, that a lawyer might be impliedly authorized, for example, to admit a fact that cannot properly be disputed. So if there's some uh, fact, it's very obvious that your client um, was driving the car when they were pulled over or something like that, um, you might as well concede that. You're not going to contest everything if it's pointless and everyone knows it. Um, or to make a, a disclosure that facilitates a satisfactory conclusion to a matter. Now, here's a couple points to remember. Discussions within a law firm are generally permissible. In other words, you don't have to ask the client to talk to the other lawyers who are within your firm. 
unless the client has for some reason specifically instructed that certain information be confined to specific lawyers. Like they only want you working on the case or you and certain partners or something like that. Um, also keep in mind that in general, the lawyer's duty of confidentiality continues after the client lawyer relationship has ended. In fact, it, it's permanent. It continues even after your client dies because sometimes the family is concerned that the lawyer who represented them could tarnish their legacy and their reputation and so forth. But the comments also uh, suggest that 1.6 really only covers current clients and other rules like 1.9 uh, cover former clients. 1.18 covers people that, for whom you did a consultation but didn't continue the representation. Now, there are kind of three sets of rules for lawyers that protect confidential information uh, just in general. And so let's uh, talk about these and distinguish them for just a moment. Um, there's attorney-client privilege, which is a well-known rule, uh, work product doctrine, which is related to that. And then what we're really talking about here under uh, rule 1.6 and some of the other rules I just mentioned, that's the ethical duty of confidentiality. Now, these overlap in that they all relate to preserving your client's confidences uh, or keeping uh, basically keeping secrets on behalf of your client, but they're a little bit distinct and it's important for you to keep them clear in your mind. You definitely Hollywood script writers uh, confuse them all the time. They think privilege and confidentiality are the same thing. And I hear lawyers and sometimes judges in practice using the terms interchangeable. The terms are not interchangeable. As we're going to see, attorney-client privilege, which I'll have other videos explaining privilege and work product doctrine, but those relate to what is admissible at trial or discoverable in litigation. And this is about the ethical duty of uh, keeping client information. And each of them has its own kind of set of rules and things that are covered and not covered. In this rule, we're going to talk about some pretty big exceptions that you need to know for purposes of the exam. Um, and those exceptions do not necessarily apply to the attorney-client privilege rules. So let's go back to the slides and um, unpack this a little bit. So attorney-client privilege and work product doctrine apply in judicial or other proceedings. So it could be an administrative hearing, let's say, in which a party seeks to compel an attorney to produce evidence or to testify concerning a client. Uh, but in contrast, the confidentiality rule or 1.6 applies in other situations, uh, not where the production of evidence is compulsory by law. And so one distinction to keep in mind between uh, attorney-client privilege and uh, work product and the conf duty of confidentiality is this is an ethical duty uh, and violations of which could be you could be subject to discipline or, or perhaps malpractice. And the other is basically there's a rule of law that prohibits the um, disclosure or production of certain types of evidence. Another type of difference between these rules is that the confidentiality rule applies to all information relating to the representation, whatever its source. And that's different from attorney-client privilege, which relates to um, communications between the lawyer and the client, but not necessarily other information that the lawyer comes across from independent sources or third parties. And the, the same is true with work product uh, doctrine. Now, let's talk about exceptions for a moment um, to the duty of confidentiality. This is section B of the rule. And I have to tell you, I think that most of your questions or maybe all of your questions on the MPRE are actually going to be about the exceptions in section B uh, to 1.6. Uh, the rule itself, the default rule that you can't uh, disclose confidential information unless it's expressly or impliedly authorized is clear enough. And so I, I think it's in in fact, too obvious for them to ask you a question about that. Don't get your hopes up. Instead, you're likely to have a sort of gotcha question as a, in, on a multiple choice exam like the MPRE about uh, whether the exceptions apply or not. So let's dive into these exceptions here. Lawyers may reveal information related to the representation of a client um, to the extent the lawyer reasonably believes necessary, one, to um, prevent reasonably certain death 
or substantial bodily harm. So this might apply if you're, you know your client is planning on murdering someone or committing suicide or something like that. Uh, you um, do, can uh, make a disclosure in order basically to save a life or protect uh, something that would be serious bodily injury. By the way, Notice the may here, I put it in bold. This is not a mandatory disclosure rule. So 1.6 does not require lawyers to tell on their clients. There are a couple of states, including Texas, that have mandatory reporting for lawyers in situations that are sort of a matter of life and death or at least uh, serious bodily harm. Um, for purposes of the MPRE, you should assume that the rule is permissive, which means that a lawyer would not be subject to discipline for simply making no disclosure or revelation of the information. Let's go on. Two, under 1.6b, is to prevent the client from committing a crime or fraud that's reasonably certain to result in substantial um, injury to the financial interests or property of another, and in furtherance of which, the client has used or is using the lawyer's services. Now, please notice that the second part of that here, uh, this only applies where the client is actually using your services to commit the crime or fraud. In other words, you realize now that they've been um, using your firm to launder money uh, to do certain transactions uh, for them or to do something else to cover up evidence or destroy evidence uh, or something like that. And But the very fact that you know that your client is committing crime and fraud unrelated to your representation uh, does not trigger the application of this rule. And again, remember for purposes of the exam of the MPRE that this is a permissive rule, not a mandatory rule. So let's go back and we're gonna move on to 1.6b3. And this is about things that your client has already done or past action. So three says, you can make, you may make a disclosure uh, that would otherwise be confidential information to prevent, mitigate, or rectify substantial injury to the financial interests or property of another that's reasonably certain to result or has resulted from the client's commission of crime or fraud in furtherance of which the client has used the lawyer's services. So Number two is basically uh, the client is, is currently doing it or is planning to. And um, number three is sort of the notice the tense of the verb. You now realize you didn't know it before that what the client was doing was using your, um, your legal services to commit a crime or fraud that would substantially injure the financial uh, interests or property of another. And if you intervene, if you warn people or say, hey, wait a second, the, uh, my client is defrauding you, um, there would be, still be time to save the situation and either prevent the harm or at least mitigate it. Four says that there's an exception. To, uh, in other words, you can disclose a client confidential information, even over the client's objection, to secure legal advice about the lawyer's compliance with these rules. Also note that normally disclosing information to seek um, advice about the case and, and how to proceed with the representation is authorized for the lawyer to carry out the representation. So what are we talking about here? Your client has put you in a difficult situation, and an easy one is you're not sure if you have a conflict of interest, right? So something uh, after the representation is underway, uh, something has arisen maybe due to a corporate merger or acquisition, and you want to talk to an ethics expert, uh, expert or professional res responsibility expert, either at the state bar or at another firm or uh, your law school professor who taught professional responsibility and ask them about it. And if you're really just seeking advice as a lawyer from someone about how to comply with the ethics rules with the representation, um, that is permitted. Of course, they're assuming you'll make no more uh, um, disclosure than necessary in order to get uh, the advice that you need. So let's go back to the rules. Five is, um, and th this is a compound rule notice, to establish a claim or defense on behalf of the lawyer in a controversy between the lawyer and the client, or to establish a defense to a criminal charge or civil claim against the lawyer um, based on upon conduct which the, in which the client was involved, or to respond to allegations in any proceeding concerning the lawyer's 
representation of the client. So uh, the first one there is, let's say um, the client is refusing to pay your fees and you're having to sue the client uh, for that, or the client is, has sued you for malpractice and um, or wants uh, fees they paid in advance uh, to be uh, for you to pay them back in restitution or something like that. And in the course of that, you have to really explain in detail uh, everything you did with the representation, why you did it, why you had to research certain topics or questions or interview certain people. And those types of disclosures, because you're, you now have a dispute with your client, a legal dispute, um, let's say over fees or over malpractice. Um, the third one is, let's say that a grievance has been filed against you and it could be by another lawyer or, or the client and you need to explain yourself. And that's going to probably require some disclosure of information that would otherwise be protected by the rule of confidentiality. And the middle uh, part of this, this rule was about you're now in trouble. You're being accused of being an accessory to a crime uh, with your client and you need to defend yourself. If you have to defend yourself because of your representation, you're now in legal trouble. Um, and let's say you're being prosecuted as a, an accessory, then you could, or a co-conspirator, um, you, you can make disclosures necessary to defend yourself. Okay, six, to comply with... Uh, other law or a court order. Now, this is, uh, I think you should assume, is an exception to basically um, all of the model rules. If the client objects to you making a disclosure and the court has ordered you to, let's say, produce certain information or turn it over or answer a question during discovery, um, the lawyer should assert all non-frivolous claims that the order is either uh, not authorized by other law or that the information sought is protected from disclosure by attorney-client privilege or other law, like a spousal privilege or something like that. So um, you at least need to kind of raise the objection. Don't just uh, comply uh, if you say, I can't, I, I don't want to do that, Your Honor. If the, the court says you have to, you won't be subject to discipline, but you should go ahead and lodge whatever um, claims you have not, that are non-frivolous uh, to making this disclosure. Um, seventh, to detect and resolve conflicts of interest arising from the lawyer's uh, change of employment or from changes in the composition or ownership of a firm, but only if the revealed information would not compromise attorney-client privilege or otherwise prejudice the client. So uh, when you change jobs, if you make a lateral move, Obviously, your new firm has to worry about um, you bringing conflicts of interest with you into the firm because of clients you've been representing or done legal work for. So it's pretty customary for them in, at some point in the employment process and the hiring process to ask you for a list of basically all the clients you've done legal work for and who the parties were in the nature of the matter. That's usually all you need to determine conflicts of interest, right? Uh, to screen for conflicts of interest regarding former clients is who the client was, who the other party was, and um, was it a criminal matter, civil matter? Um, was it commercial litigation or uh, personal injury or intellectual property? Something like that, uh, sort of general about the nature of the matter. And in fact, I would encourage law students to, if you are doing internships at firms, just for your own records, start keeping a log or a personal record of every case you're asked to work on at your firm, who the parties are and the nature of the matter, because you might need it in the future for purposes of screening for conflicts of interest regarding former clients or helping future employers do that. So um, you can make some revelations, but again, this doesn't mean that you then have a license to gossip about the former client or um, a dish about all of their eccentric behaviors or share something that would uh, constitute a waiver of attorney-client privilege. It normally won't um, be a waiver of privilege for you to disclose to a, another law firm uh, uh, who you represented and what the nature of the claim or matter was. So we're almost done, I promise. There's an example that they give that I have actually seen them use as test questions. This is from the comments to the rule about um, preventing serious bodily injury or death. Uh, so let's say a lawyer knows that a client has accidentally discharged toxic waste into a town's water supply. That lawyer may reveal this information 
to the authorities if there's a present and substantial risk that a person who drinks the water will contract a life-threatening or debilitating disease, and the lawyer's disclosure is actually necessary to eliminate the threat or reduce the number of victims. Now, if the um, contamination or discharge is already known, then you don't need to report on your client, right? But if you're the only one who could save people's lives, then that's a sort of the textbook example of uh, preventing serious bodily injury or death. Now, this is also important for the MPRE. Uh, the comments note where it's practicable, the lawyer should first seek to persuade a client to take suitable action to obviate the need for the lawyer to make the disclosure. So here we're talking about those, all the exceptions under B. And normally you're going to, the default rule is you're gonna keep the, the information confidential. Uh, sometimes though, you are allowed to make disclosures even that your client doesn't want you to make if one of the exceptions in B applies. If you are given this as an answer option on the MPRE, this is probably the right answer. The, your first recourse is to try to convince the client to make the disclosure themselves or to authorize you to make the disclosure so that you're not making the disclosure um, uh, over the client's objection. And if that happens, then you no longer need to cover yourself with an exception. You are acting with the client's express authorization. Um, and in any case, a, a disclosure adverse to the client's interest should be no greater than the lawyer uh, uh, reasonably believes is necessary. Okay, 1.6C, we can go through very quickly. A lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of or unauthorized access to information relating to a representation of a client. And so here we're talking about uh, those things that I mentioned earlier, having loud conversations on the phone um, in a crowded elevator or in economy class of an airplane where everybody can hear your conversation, um, or it could be recklessly leaving um, your um, files spread out on the, uh, a, a table in Starbucks and uh, um, when you walk away for a minute or go up to the counter and other people walking by could see, it could uh, take a look at it. Um, from the ABA standpoint, if you look at some of their re, um, ethics opinions in the last few years, they're concerned about data security. There have been some pretty serious cases about um, hackers um, hacking um, into a firm's network, uh, often trying to get information not for um, the other party in litigation, but for uh, commercial secrets, trade secrets and um, patent secrets and, and things like that. Um, that they could use uh, maybe to engage in stock market purchases and, um, and sales and so forth. So that's usually the type of information that they're hunting for if they um, hack into your firm's network. It does happen quite a bit. And so you're expected to have a reasonable amount of data security or network security uh, at your firm and your firm um, employees, both the lawyers and the staff, are expected to be trained about uh, protecting client information, not leaving client files laying around where family members can read them, and so forth. Now, uh, comment 18 is referred to as a sort of a safe harbor provision. It basically says that the, no violation of this rule uh, of 1.6 C will be found if the lawyer has made reasonable efforts to prevent the access or disclosure. And so the, the idea is that um, no matter what your security and network encryption is and all the efforts you can make, um, you sometimes a, a really sophisticated hacker might be able to get through all of your firewalls and get the information anyways, or um, you have a leak, uh, somebody in your firm who, uh, you, even though you've trained them not to make disclosures, they do it anyways, or they leave and on bad terms and make disclosures about the clients. And so we know that you can never like 100% protect all of your clients' information. So the question is whether you're sort of up to date 
with your security measures and security protocols. And if you're taking reasonable efforts and what's reasonable, well, that's gonna depend. And they give a number of factors that they would weigh in this if there was a complaint from your client about a data breach, let's say. Um, how sensitive was the information? The more sensitive the information is, the more effort you needed to put into protecting it. The likelihood of disclosure if additional safeguards are not employed, right? So what was the risk here? And then the cost of employing additional safeguards, right? So you can't turn your firm into um, the CIA headquarters or something like that where, where there's just a re ridiculous amount of security that you actually, you and your clients can't afford. The difficulty of implementing this, the safeguards and the extent to which the safeguards adversely affect the lawyer's ability to represent clients. So does your lawyer have to um, change 27 passwords every day when they come into work um, and uh, go through retina scans and things like that? At some point, it um, the security measures uh, start to really have diminishing marginal uh, returns or returns. And then the cost uh, on the lawyer's activities, it's, it's actually making it more difficult to represent clients. So you have to find a balance. And if you are subject to discipline for this rule and you're availing yourself of this safe harbor provision, then these are the factors that they would look at to decide if your efforts were reasonable. And that concludes our lecture about Model Rule 1.6, the duty of confidentiality.